On Tech News Today, the EFF goes after Facebook and the other social networks for censorship. Plus, Google invented a Star Trek-style communicator. And finally, finally, you can order a pizza with a push of a button. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, November 23rd, 2015. This episode is brought to you by PillPack, a full service pharmacy that combines personalized service, convenient packaging, and modern technology to make your life easier. Visit pillpack.com slash twit to save $20 on vitamins and OTCs when you transfer your prescriptions. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co-anchor today is CNET.com Editor-in-Chief Lindsay Turrentine. Hey, Lindsay, how are you doing today? Great, Mike. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. You hear that sound? That sound you hear is the sound of a slow news week. Uh, because, of course, this uh, here in the United States is Thanksgiving week. We have Thanksgiving celebrated on Thursday. And so lots of people in the industry and in the media, uh, et cetera, take the whole week off. And so things kind of like get kind of slow. And today, for example, we have a pretty slow news day, uh, just a few stories to cover. None of them uh, epic, none of them uh, super, super colossally important, but some very, very interesting. So if you're ready, we can jump right into the news today. I'm ready. All right. That makes one of us. The Electronic Frontier <laughs> Foundation has created a new website to make censorship more transparent. It's called onlinecensorship.org. And the site encourages user-contributed stories of censorship, especially by large companies like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. The site addresses censorship issues like Facebook's real names policy. And it helps users appeal to get their content or accounts restored after being censored. Uh, Lindsay, this just seems like a great idea. I'm glad they're doing this. They got funding for this. And uh, it just seems like a, a helpful thing because oftentimes uh, big companies like Facebook don't tend to devote the resources to dealing with people's complaints. Uh, somebody says, oh, you know, you blocked my content. You And I disagree that, that this is a violation of the policy. I think it wasn't a violation. Of the, like, where do they go? Facebook and, and the other companies tend to go, oh, you know, just shut up and go away. Uh, but uh, now the EFF is uh, putting some, uh, some, some pressure behind these claims. Yeah, this is great. I mean, for one thing, uh, if you head to this website, the stories that have been collected there about individual censorship issues are really interesting and they really run the gamut. Some are about advertisers who haven't been allowed to advertise, like the story here about a bra company um, that wasn't allowed to advertise on Facebook because of what was behind the link. Uh, there are also stories about um, about people who are really fighting to use not their real name for all kinds of safety reasons in their home countries. A lot of just really interesting storytelling linked out from the site, but also it's handy because the appeals section walks you through how to appeal on each different social media platform that you might want to appeal on. So it is, it's just very useful yeah, as well. And, and it's clear, it's not very complicated, the site. Yeah, it's a nice site. And uh, many of the stories they have there we've covered on the show. Uh, and uh, And it's great to have a site that, you know, where you can actually go. So we're, we're, I'm going to be monitoring this site, I guess is what I'm saying, for uh, if they have a good uh, process for you to deal with the stories we cover. Let's see if they can keep up with this in terms of timeliness. Probably not. But uh, but to the extent that they can, we may reference uh, their various uh, solutions to these these different censorship problems. Very nice. You know, you know before we move on from this, I think it's uh, interesting that a lot of this is going to be a difference of opinion about what should and should not be censored. I mean, of course, all the, well, Facebook especially and Google Plus especially, they're super into censoring stuff. And, uh, you know, and they just think that certain types of pictures, for example, shouldn't be allowed, uh, bare breasts and things like that. Uh, and uh, other people think, well, well, there's nothing wrong with that. You should be allowed to show that, especially if it's in a, in a context that's, that's, you know, that's uh, normal stuff you know, um, breastfeeding mothers and stuff like that. Um, so there's going to be some difference of opinion, and, and this is this would be nice that there'll be pushback on that part of it as well. It's a difficult problem for the Facebooks and the Google Pluses of the world because, of course, they're international, 
and different cultures and societies have different values about what's appropriate and what isn't, and they have to make those decisions. It's not not easy, but yeah, even within our own country, I mean, you know, different oh, yeah. different users, different regions, uh, different cultures within the United States. And, you know, I think that there are probably a lot of parents out there who are extremely nervous about what their kids see and have a very low tolerance, right? People who just don't want to have those hard conversations because kid walked up behind, you know, and looked over their shoulder and said, you know, why isn't that woman wearing a bra? I don't know. I think some of this will slowly change over time as cultural norms shift. Uh, but it is really nice to be keeping track of it in one place. Because then I think once, once an organization starts to track these censorship issues in one place, it gets really easy to see when the pattern has become a problem. Yeah, absolutely true. Well, Time Magazine is reporting that Google actually created, wait for it, folks, a Star Trek-style communicator. You know, those badges worn on Starfleet uniforms of the next generation and Deep Space Nine that enabled you to computer, uh, communicate via computer when you touched it. Uh, you could a also access the Universal Translator, if I recall. Now, Google's version connected to Google Voice Search, which would have been awesome. The Google Communicator paired via Bluetooth to a smartphone, of course, and that's how it connected to Google. Sadly, Google built a prototype that functioned, and then they scrapped the whole program. Personally, I think the engineers behind this project should quit Google and boldly go independent to build this thing for real. Why, why don't we have this, Lindsay? Well, we kind of do. I mean, think about a lot of smart watches, right? And you, Android yeah. Wear, you can get a lot of this functionality in a watch. Um, pin it to your shirt. That's what I say. Take yeah. your Android Wear watch and pin it to your shirt. There you have it. That, that is a good point that it's, you know, it's like you really want to be pinning things to fabric and so on. And, and you know, what if you, you know, yeah, it's, it's an impractical solution. However, I still, uh, as I've said uh, several times on the show, I still want something like the Amazon Echo, but everywhere. I want to just be able to talk. I almost always have my hands full. I'm almost, almost always doing something with my hands and don't really, I'd love to be able to interact with, you name it, Siri, Google Now, whatever. Just uh, some virtual assistant that connects me to the internet, enables me to communicate with people and so on without touching anything. Of course, in this case, you have to touch it. So, so. you want the HER style earbud? Yes. Those, yes. Are, those are coming. Those are coming. Yes, that, yes. That will come to you soon. Yeah, except Except that one was a little creepy. But the, the, the <laughs> voice quality of all that, you know, and it's kind of interesting. There's a, there's a, a good story on Business Insider that uh, people who are interested in this topic might want to go check out. It, it talks about why Google doesn't give a personality to Google Now. And they do it on purpose. They feel like it's misleading. And they, they, <laughs> Google is creeped out a little bit, I think, by the her scenario where the person is believing and interacting psychologically and emotionally like the virtual assistant they're interacting with is actually a person. And I personally think that that is an inev inevitability. People are going to be interacting with virtual assistants as if they were people. They're going to feel things for these virtual assistants. I think that's human nature, but Google's trying to avoid it. And, and I, guess, I guess that's a, a laudable uh, thing to try to avoid. It is, but it, it really is probably going to hurt customer loyalty. People, I mean, people have very strong feelings about Siri, even though they realize that Siri is not a person. But I think, you know, there's a there's certain kind of affection that you develop for this voice that is helpful, right? That's what we all want in our friends, people who are helpful and care about you. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Absolutely. Well, that, you know, I've, I wrote a column about this and I realized that one of the reasons people like dogs uh, is because dogs reciprocate your affection. They, uh, you know, they, they're loyal to you. They have all these virtues that people don't have. You can, <laughs> you can actually make them happy by feeding them or whatever. Uh, and so, and so unlike children or other people in your life, they're, they're actually kind of satisfying creatures to have relationships with. And to a certain extent, virtual assistants will be the same way. They'll be totally loyal to you. They'll be looking out for you all the time that, you know, and, and they'll be, they'll be straightforward to the extent that they, they won't have a separate Absolutely. independent human agenda of their own separate from you. Instant empathy. Yeah. All the time. I, yeah. I just want Siri to say, I'm sorry you had a bad day. Well, it's kind of funny. Yesterday, uh, you know, with uh, with the virtual assistant that I shall not name for fear of actually activating on, on Echo units across the land. Uh, yesterday, well, when you deal with this virtual assistant that comes from Amazon, uh, you <laughs> you can have an alarm go off. And the way you make it be quiet, if it's playing music or you want the alarm to stop or whatever, you, is you say, virtual assistant name here stop and it stops and yesterday just for fun instead of saying stop i said 
shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. And then my wife got mad at me for being so, uh, so harsh with the Amazon Echo. Well, really, I mean, that was pretty mean. It was pretty mean. You're so going to you hurt is her feelings. <laughs> yeah, this is where it begins. I, I often say thank you, and she's like, she's like, it's my pleasure. And I think, really? I Like, are you experiencing <laughs> pleasure? Is that, that kind of like too much information or something? I don't know. It's just, it's all very weird, but it's coming. And I, I like I said before, this, uh, you know, interacting with virtual assistants as if they were people is inevitable. It is going to happen. It's already happening. All right. Well, uh, finally, a pizza is now just one button push away, thanks to a new easy order button from Domino's Pizza. That's the good news. The bad news is that this is for UK customers only for now. This physical button, which is made by a company called Flick, pairs with your smartphone where you can pre-program your order. And of course, Domino's has your account information and so on. So you could just set this up so that you push the button and a pizza shows up. Uh, thank goodness, because it's so hard to get junk food these days, isn't it? Especially from Domino's. Dom Domino's actually has so many different <laughs> ways to automatically order. It's it's really mind-blowing if you go in there and look at all the different ways, and now they've got it down to this. Yep. Well, you know, Domino's has to have this kind of thing because have you had a Domino's pizza? Uh, not in about a decade. Yeah. I I call it pizza in yeah. air quotes. Yeah. Um, it's Bisquick but, you know, with ketchup and, and uh, American cheese on the top. I mean, it's horrible. Exactly. So, but at least you can get that Bisquick in a flat form very, very quickly in the UK. I don't understand why this is just in the UK. I mean, I guess small kind of limited geographical area, but um, there's still lots of people in the UK and directions are very complicated there. Yeah. Seems like it'd be good to test this in an American city. Come on. Yeah. Let's bring it on. I, I might actually force one, force a Domino's pizza down uh, just to test the button. I mean, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Although it does, it does seem to require some setup. Yes. You still have to set up your yep. order ahead of time, which is the thing that always stops me from using easy order systems because I don't want to bother with logging in and filling right. out all my credit card information in the first place. Yeah. The other thing is that, I mean, like I, I have a son, uh, like we're all, everybody loves pizza, but I have one son who I think he pretty much gets the same type of pizza every time he orders. And personally, I always get try to get something I've never had before. I try to, you know, change it up and stuff like that. So I, I would I would actually not be able to use the button in, in practice. But uh, first worldest of problems, I'm sure. Well, in product, sure. in product update news, a site called Uswitch is reporting that Apple is working on an iPhone app that provides tech support and troubleshooting help as an alternative to the Apple Store Genius Bar or the, the website. The app, in fact, mirrors the desktop browser-based support on the Apple website and also may connect people to live tech support if they need it. I think that this is... Uh, you know, this comes from one source and it's based on leaked screenshots, but this makes perfect sense for Apple because, of course, uh, any time you can get people to provide their own tech support by going through a knowledge base of some kind, uh, you save a ton of money on an actual human, although they will link you to a human ultimately. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, I unfortunately have a lot of experience taking my iPhone into the Genius Bar because I yeah. broke my screen twice in a month. Um, Apple has actually gotten already so much better at repairing iPhones quickly for less money than they used to. I mean, even the last year, it's kind of gotten cheaper and cheaper. And I found that the one barrier to doing this was actually going through the Genius Bar reservation system. It was overly complicated for something as simple as, I need you to replace my screen, which I think happens, you know, all the time. So this, this does make a lot of sense, especially if it gets people through that experience faster. I, for one, believe that given the amount that we pay for Apple devices that they should make house calls, but that's just me. <laughs> All right. Well, we got some more news coming right up, but first I want to talk about our new sponsor, PillPack. This is an amazing thing, folks. You're going to love this product. Basically, PillPack is a, it's an online pharmacy that like so many of our advertisers have disrupted an industry that was ripe for disruption. The problem with uh, pharmaceuticals and vitamins and over-the-counter medications and prescription medications is that, you know, if you've got multiple ones, they all have different schedules. You take this one three times a day, you take that one every day, uh, and then this one you take it for eight days and then you stop. And, you know, it can be very confusing about, you know, did I take it this morning? I don't really recall. I seem to... And so they solve all those problems with these amazing things they call pill packs. Now, if you take a look at this, this is what you get in the mail. You get this long thing and you just rip one off. And and so it'll, it'll combine your vitamins and your whatever it is that you have uh, all together in a pack. And each pack 
is brilliantly designed because it has, it has not only the day, the date, it has the time, it has the exact contents of what's in the, in the package. And so the, basically what you do is you, tr you, you send your prescriptions to uh, pillpack.com. You, they will connect with your doctor even if they have any questions or whatever. They'll interact directly with your doctor. You also tell them which vitamins and minerals you need, over-the-counter uh, pharmaceutical products, and so on. And then they just send you this amazing box. And all you have to do is say, oh, yep, it is uh, 8 o'clock p.m. on Saturday. Time to rip this open and consume the contents of this packet. It's that simple. And it's so great to use because, of course, it solves the whole problem of, you know, these are pharmaceuticals we're talking about. You don't want to take too many. You don't want to skip them. It's super important that you take the right dose at the right time. And that's what pill pack enables you to do. Another benefit, you don't have to go to the pharmacy and wait in line. You don't have to sit there and have a conversation about your personal health in a crowded room full of uh, uh, people. Uh, you can interact with them discreetly over the internet. Again, like they will, they will also interact with your doctor if necessary. And there's no extra cost be beyond your standard copay for medications. Shipping is free. So here's some, what I want you to do. Visit pillpack.com slash twit to sign up now. And when you use our link and transfer your prescription to PillPack, you'll get a credit for $20 worth of vitamins and over-the-counter medications. That's pillpack.com slash twit. And we thank PillPack for their support of Tech News Today. In human resources news, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced Friday that he'll take two months, two months off for paternity leave after his daughter's upcoming birth. That's only half of the four months Facebook allows for parental leave during the first year of the child's life. Two things about this, uh, Lindsay, that jump out at me. The first is that, you know, here's one of the busiest guys in Silicon Valley. I mean, he's running Facebook. He's been doing it since he was a college student. Uh, he dropped out to launch Facebook, and he's been running and sprinting all that time, and now he's taking two entire months off. And the second thing that jumps out is that Facebook has a four months of parental leave policy for new parents. I think that's amazing. It's Four months is generous. It's a lot. Um, it's not as much as many European countries. I love, though, I think what I'm hearing here is that the four months of parental leave applies to mothers and fathers. Yes. And if that's the case, I think that that is absolutely fantastic well, because I, I, I am a huge believer in paternity leave for yeah. starters. It's incredibly important for the pressure to come, well, to be evenly applied, basically. And, and men want to be with their children too. I think it's it's a fantastic thing. And I'm really happy to see Mark Zuckerberg taking even the two months because even though it's not the four months that he's allowed to take by his own company rules, it's quite a bit. And I think it sets a really good example. I do too. And and uh, the other thing that is great about their policy, if you missed it in, in my comments, you can take the any part of the four months during any time of that first year. So let's say, for example, that you that, that a woman works at well, let's say let's say a, a man like Mark Zuckerberg, the father, works at Facebook, and the mother works at a different company, and that other company has a one month leave policy. That means that the man can wait a month, and then when the wife goes back to work, he can take four months starting at that point. So the child gets five months of full time parental uh, care. So uh, that's not bad. And like you said, it's a lot better than a lot of European. Uh, countries. But for those of you Europeans who are not used to the American system, most Americans get like 20 minutes or something like that. <laughs> it's really terrible. Very, very, not a lot of parental leave time. No, it's, so. it's terrible. And to imagine, I mean, I'm sure Facebook's a big company. There are probably plenty of couples who both work there. That's yeah. eight months yeah. of leave. That's fantastic. Yep. Absolutely. Well, we got a uh, big number for you today, 25. Okay. That doesn't sound like a big number, but check this out. That's 25 is how many DMCA takedown requests Google got every second, 24-7, all year this year, on average, according to the company's own transparency report. That rate is double what it was last year. How do they keep up with this, Lindsay? It's unbelievable. I don't know. And it's really interesting. I wonder why. 
I'm curious about why it's increasing so quickly. I mean, the volume of content on the web, I suppose, is increasing very quickly. And and people are getting much savvier about how they post photos and images. And I'm guessing that's a big part of it. But some of it may also be the sort of AI ability to recognize those images yeah. resulting in takedowns. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure, but it's interesting. Yeah, somebody in the chat room uh, said that, uh, by the way, that our talk about parental leave was anti-capitalist. Quite the contrary. The the market, capitalism uh, involves markets for labor as well. And it's very, very difficult to hire great people in Silicon Valley because there are so many companies that are hiring and so few super high qualified people. So one of the ways that they... Uh, they get over this uh, limited supply of great people as they have benefits like four months leave. So it's it's a very capitalist policy. This isn't uh, they're not doing it uh, uh, necessarily just out of the kindness of their hearts. They need to do stuff like that in order to attract the best people and attract them away from Google and Apple and all the other companies in the valley. All right. Well, in news you can use, Google has finally added uh, Jordan's Petra site to Google Street View. Let's check out this sort of video slash Street View. Uh, hand-holding thing that they put up today. Just yeah. south of Amman, in the Middle East, sits Petra. Nestled deep in the mountains, it takes nearly an hour's walk so along we're zooming in pathway on a Google Earth-like view, and now we're in Petra. If you see the ridge, well, it went fast, but there is the treasury, the the preeminent site there. But what, I, I went to Petra about a year ago. And uh, that is an amazing sight. Now, if you if you bust a, a right right there and go down that way, you can just keep walking and walking and walking. There's all kinds of, uh, you know, essentially buildings and rooms and, and uh, you know, I don't know what you call them. They're sort of really fancy caves carved into the into the rocks. And this is really the most amazing, quote, street, unquote, in the world, that at least that I've ever seen. And it's a beautiful sight. And it's so cool. That they uh, that they street viewed this is street view a verb yet? Uh, it Lindsay? should be. It should be. I think it is because you just made it made yeah. it. So I have I didn't I don't know anything about this site. So I'm super excited because this is a way to discover something I don't know anything about. Okay, so it Jason, looks can, beautiful. Can you hold it still right there? You see that ridge the, along the sort of like waist level that goes along that entire. So you walk about a mile down this narrow corridor and that ridge is act, was actually a a man-made li little like creek that's how they got water into the into the site yeah yeah wow very amazing anyway and and we walked in we hoofed it in and then you you can you can go all the way down the corridor and then you go up and there's more stuff up above and then when we came back we rode a camel and that was really fun so anyway all right we got some uh, some Feedback from some TNT fans, including email from Mike Gallimore, who said, I found your discussion of Google Plus on Friday's show interesting. I can appreciate that you and Christina are creators, and it's important to you as people in the media to go where you have lots of followers, but I think you miss the effect it has on those who consume content. Twitter might occasionally have something interesting on which I'll read, uh, uh, that I'll want to read, but I have no desire to have an account because I have no need to create an audience. Twitter seems to get that model and makes everything public. If I have to have an account with Facebook to follow some stuff, then check Twitter for something else and Google Plus for something else, et cetera. It's a real pain. Ultimately, content consumers of the product as viewership is what's sold to advertisers and determines what you can charge for advertising. The more pain it is for end users to consolidate all the little bits of information, the fewer will bother for anything other than the biggest sites. Google Plus reduces the scope of their content and makes going there for any content worth less for the same amount of work. Also, we need a place where ideas can be discussed without having our opinions at a point in time being tied to us forever. Google Plus could have been that place, which would have been in keeping with the all information mandate of Google. Instead, they've tried to rip off Facebook poorly. And then when that didn't work, somehow they thought making the site narrower in scope would make more people want to sign up crazy. All right. So Mike, uh, you brought up a lot of issues there. I don't know uh, what your feelings or thoughts and, and information is on Google Plus, Lindsay, but I'll, I'm going to address this and you can jump if you want to. Basically, um, it's a good point. This is one of the big problems uh, in social media. There are lots and lots of social media sites. And if you want to get content on multiple sites, you have to go to multiple sites. And if you want to uh, read and consume content without signing up, you can pretty much do that on most of the sites pretty easily. Although it's, I don't recommend it because you need some sort of account. 
um, in order to build up a, a, a feed. So even on Twitter, for example, yes, everything's public, but if you want to actually follow a bunch of specific people or media outlets or whatever it is you want to follow, you have to have an account associated with that so they can remember who you want to follow. Uh, of course, on Twitter, you can be anonymous. You can use a to totally fake name, and they're fine with that. On Google Plus now, you can be completely anonymous and use a fake name. They don't care. Facebook has a real names policy, but of course, it's ridiculous, and they can't. They have no way to to do it. So I think that on all the websites, you can be anonymous. You can change the account. Uh, create a new account every week if you want to. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Uh, regarding Google+, Plus narrowing its scope, I think the problem was that Google wanted to make Google+, Plus the everything social network. It was everything Facebook was, and it was a lot more than Facebook was. It was a, it had the video, you know, Hangout videos, uh, chats. It had uh, something called Sparks initially, which was a news discovery engine that they scrapped after a year. It had, uh, you know, Zagat guides in there. It had, you know, location-based stuff. It, it actually replaced their their uh, Android-based location uh, service where you could, you know, essentially Google's version of find, f find My Friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a big confusing mess, I think, to a lot of new users. Those of us who were super uh, heavy users got used to it. We learned our way around, and it was fine. Uh, but what they've done is they say, okay, you know what we're really good at? We're really good at bringing people together who have share the same passions and giving them space to have great conversations around their passions. That's what we're really good for. So we scrapped the rest. They spun out photos. They spun out hangouts. They got rid of all the rest of the stuff. And now it's just a place to, to engage through communities, which is kind of like Reddit, where it's like, you know, here's the topic. Go talk about this topic. And then there, there's something that they call collections, which is like, okay, I'm going to post things, but categorize those things so that if you don't want to, in my case, if you don't want to follow my food obsessions, you can opt out of food, but you can still get my technology content, that sort of thing. So it is a great site. And, and I think that's, that streamlining, I personally I think streamlining it was a good idea in principle because it makes it simpler to use for lots of people to just get to what it's really good at. That's my own two cents, but you're right. There's, there are too many social networks, too many places to get content. And uh, I thought five years ago that Google Plus was going to be the place that would end all that and be the one place you had to go and get everything. But it turns out that um, it's not ideal for that. It's ideal for hanging out with other super fans. Lindsay, do you have a, any comment on this whole problem of where you get content, uh, having to follow these different uh, social networks and so on? I, you know, my comment is probably not... Um it's, it's not, it's a little obvious, but I gave up on Google Plus quite a while ago simply because it just, I did not have the time to cultivate what I needed to cultivate to feel like I was part of a community there. And that's been the challenge all along. And just a few social networks have managed to hold on to that and to have that sort of sense of community right at the start. Google Plus wasn't able to do what Instagram was able to do. And now what, say, Snapchat is able to do, which is really grab a younger set and sort of raise a generation. Google Plus seemed to go right after an existing set, which was the Facebook crowd. And that didn't work because Facebook loyalists were already Facebook loyalists. So it wasn't, I think it just wasn't different enough at the very beginning. Yeah, absolutely. I do recommend, though, that, uh, you know, you can pretty much get the news, you know, you can get the content that's out there on on Facebook. You can get it on Twitter. You can get it on Reddit. You can get it on Google+. Plus. There are lots of places to get, you know, all the news. And it, it can drive you crazy to, to scatter your attention across all these different social networks. So my recommendation is look deep inside yourself and, and, and understand which of these you just feel comfortable in. If you like Reddit and that you really love that, then really embrace Reddit. I'm not saying, you know, ignore all the social networks, but at least find one social network that you are throw yourself into with all fours because if you really become a, a, a fully engaged member of of a community that's where the real value to me of social networking uh, lies is to really get in there and spend quality time interacting with other people getting to know people following people cultivating uh, great sources uh, of people for your stream and so on that's and and in my case i like doing that on google plus and then i automate the, you know my posts to other sites um, but your mileage may vary. Maybe, maybe Twitter's the one for you. Maybe Facebook is, maybe it's Reddit. Maybe it's something else, Pinterest, Snapchat, whatever. So many to choose from, find out which one you like best and stick with it. That's my advice. All right. We got some email on the same topic from Joe Kennedy who said, I know you support Google plus, and I think you're right about all you say about it. I was a little concerned when I looked for the tech news today community and noticed that the last entry was June 18th, 2014. Well, Joe, that is the wrong community. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, 
lots of people set up multiple tech news today uh, communities on Google Plus. There's uh, a few of them on Facebook, I think, um, you know, fan sites or whatever. Uh, so you want to check for the real one. The real Google Plus community has roughly 4,100 and something members. We passed the 4,000 mark like two weeks ago or something. It's growing pretty fast. Uh, so, so search, you know, go to the communities era, area, search for tech news today and look for the one that has 4, 000, more than 4,160 members. That's the real one. Uh, subscribe to that, sign up, join us in the community, and interact with us. And there are posts there every single day. And we're trying to build it up because it's a, it's a really uh, great community there. So uh, check us out there. You can also find us on Facebook, on Tech News Today TV, uh, et cetera. So wherever you want to uh, check us out. And if you've got uh, some comment on anything we've talked about here or you want to suggest coverage, just send email to tnt at twit.tv. Our TNT fan of the day is Lewis Wilson, who sent us this picture by email. He's listening to Tech News Today while driving his 18-wheeler. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And look, it's all dark out because he's yeah. up at, you know, 4 in the morning Way getting ready early. to leave. Yeah. Wow. So very, I think very I see cool. some grain silos in the background there, too. Yeah, exactly. That is not a low-carb silo right there. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. And please use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. Uh, Lindsay Turntine, what's going on with, with you and CNET.com? Well, we are, we are actually super busy this week because... Mm. Um, at, as is our way, we're tracking the, right now we've got the 29 best Black Friday tech deals we found uh -huh. so far on the site. Uh, and then we also have a really great post about all the tech you you should not try to buy on uh, on Black Friday. And so we're, we're kind of following both parts of that story. The part that's uh, the part you should be paying attention to. And we're also following the hype um, and telling you what you should just really not do yeah. while you're holiday shopping. Yeah. Good. I look forward to your coverage. And I, for one, remember when Black Friday took place on Friday and uh, and you would go to the store and you get in line, you get some real, really good deals. Nowadays, like Black Friday isn't necessarily on Friday. Black Monday isn't necessarily yeah. on Monday. Everybody's trying to jockey for position and like game the system. It's like and so Cyber on. Week. Yeah. Yeah. That, it's, a, it, it's a good it's Whatever a good week is. to unplug, actually, and, and not buy anything. All right, Lindsay. Well, thank you so much. And we will see you next Monday. See you next Monday. Right, bye bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Spotify or choose some other way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. If you'd like to help us grow our audience, here's how you can do it. Just post a link to twit.tv slash TNT on your favorite social network and tag three friends and recommend that they subscribe. Only if they you think that they would like the show. Join Google our Google Plus community, as I said. Just search Google Plus for Tech News Today and find the community that has more than 4,000 members. And you can follow me at Elgin. Com. Also, don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weekday. And that is the Tech News Today. This show is produced by Jason Cleanthus and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name's Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>